Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, technically Thanksgiving in America, although it's one in the morning. I, I want to put out there before we get into this episode that I am aware that we're going very cerebral right now. And I will be getting back to some more of those fun episodes where I pick a really super interesting topic and then deep dive with lots of pictures and that kind of stuff. But eh, we're kind of in the middle of this weird phase where we're dealing with a, a societal tug of war. And what I'm trying to do is equip us with conversation, rationale, thought process, so that you can find what you believe in the midst of all this chaos. So that as you have conversations in the near future, which I think will be very pivotal to our future, you'll have me contributing my little touch points, but then you'll have, more importantly, your take on things. Again, I think it goes without saying, do your own research, come up with your own solutions, make up your own mind. Again, if I say anything that frustrates you, as I always say, it just means that you're more equipped with your own beliefs. And what a transition that was. This episode is called Poisonous Beliefs. And it is very involved, believe it or not. This isn't going to be just talking about things that are very harmful that we absorb into our character, but sort of the process, the platform that needs to be created to activate that virus in our system. It's almost like an A-B binary weapon. The belief system, poetically, is the B. But A is going to be the architecture underneath the belief system that activates it. You're probably going, okay, what are you talking about, dude? Well, what would be a poisonous belief? Poisonous belief, at its fundamental definition, would be doing harm. A lot of times, the poisonous belief harms ourselves. We believe something is something good for us, something we should do to ourselves or not do to ourselves, and it ends up in our demise, our deterioration, our lack of happiness, getting ourselves into our own demise, as I like to say. But there's a architecture underneath it. Now, I'm one of those old-fashioned guys that uh, rightfully acknowledges two biological genders. The key word is biological. There are only two biological genders. You might have a bunch of mental genders, but there's only two biological. So if I wanted you, say I'm a bad NWO guy, I want you to start fracturing your mind because what I really want you to do is, one, be super unhappy, but two, I don't want you to procreate. I want that to be as difficult as possible. But what, I, what I've kind of deduced is if I can get you to look in the mirror and not recognize what you are, then I got you. For as long as you maintain that mental illness to not be able to know who you are, I mean physically know who you are, we all kind of wonder who we are psychologically and spiritually. I have to teach you a new paradigm of thought. And I have to give you a lots of hooks that what I'm teaching you is necessary, that harm is being done where harm is not being done. Because do harm, again, applies to, from you to yourself, from you to others, from others to you, and others to others. There are so many of each one of those categories. I think I'm just going to go through a few. But we're in the epidemic of new belief systems that are completely acidic, completely poisonous to your future, that are based on perceptions of other to other harm. You are doing something bad to somebody else. You could be saying a word that has been deemed off-limits. You could be addressing someone traditionally, as we have addressed each other for 
tens of thousands of years, and now all of a sudden that's bad in these mentally ill people. Now, if you have a friend that likes to be called uh, Mr. Strawberry and you don't mind calling him Mr. Strawberry, well, then you just go right ahead. I'm not talking about that. But before we get totally into the details, let's pull back for one second to identify an archetype of sort of what's going on in our time frame right now. It used to be, if there was someone on your block, up in your business, they were pretty rare. The old lady that's always looking out her window to see when you came home from work and and she was cheated on, you know, 30 years ago. So every time your schedule varies, she wants to tell your wife that you're probably doing what her ex did. She's a shit starter, as they always say. And that was rare. There was one in uh, Beetle, no, not Beetle, just Edward Scissorhands, the, the religious lady who just thought the second coming was around the corner, everyone's a demon, and she was a weirdie. Today, that archetype is trying to become the norm. Everyone's up in your grill constantly. You gotta wear a mask. You gotta keep six feet from people. You can't have too many people in your house. This is the new one. But before that, it was... You can't use, you know, just recently, and it's still overlapping with the one we have now, sir, ma'am, boy, girl, Mr., Mrs., she, he. All these things are trying to get deprecated with the new social programming from Europe. And those who are pushing it in Europe aren't serving the European community either. They're serving the NWO. The Agenda 21 slash Agenda 2030 individuals that want to organically depopulate the world as much, much as possible when there's nothing that can stop their plan or their, their scenario of having to wipe out the planet in some catastrophic stroke of something. They are never going to get the world convinced about this lunacy in such a way that we will go from 7.5 billion, approaching 8, down to below 500 million in perpetual balance with nature, as the Georgia Guidestones say. So you can most likely vouch that regardless of where you live in the world, you are feeling this invasion in your life. Your social media, if you have any, and you look at your, your posts, of your feed of everyone else's posts, there's got to be a few people in there, if not a lot of people in there, who are trying to tell you how to live your life. You will get phone calls from long-term, long-lost friends, and they'll make little salutations to you and ask you how you're doing. But before the call is over, they're engaging in your business, your absolute private business. What's interesting is, is that these recent four years have revealed a tremendous amount of bad behavior in humanity at the upper, upper level of control. Royal families engaging in pedophilia, celebrities and bankers engaging in pedophilia, human trafficking, all these different things. But those same people that are so worried about you wearing a device over your face, which does nothing more than give you brain damage, does not protect you against what they've been told that it protects you against. They don't care about those other things at all. In fact, a lot of my friends who are in that camp are poo-pooing that that ever happens in the world. Doesn't matter how many pedo circuits are busted. Doesn't matter how much evidence we have. They don't want to believe it. So that is a, a poisonous belief they won't allow inside their system, which would actually save lives, rescue children, rescue women that are being trafficked around the world as unpaid slavery prostitutes. I don't know about you, but when I think about my past, all the way back to my first memories of being alive, because I am here now, my past does sort of feel like a dream. It feels like a dream on many levels. One, because I don't think the human mind is capable of fully reconstructing, like brainstorm the movie, 
every single sense you had, you know, like you might remember very vividly something that happened to you when you were four, but we don't have the ability to smell the room, to roll our hands through the carpet. I mean, we have a memory of maybe how it, it felt on a dopamine level, but we don't have a feeling of what it really feels like on the underside of our hand. As well, because every decade gets worse and worse and worse, you go back and you realize the world was a better place. We weren't so mean. We weren't so worried about being so hard all the time. And gosh darn it, a boy was a boy and a girl was a girl. No one was talking about this. Other stuff. And you can like each other however you want to like each other. Boy, boy, girl, girl. One guy likes both. One guy likes to dress like a girl. I mean, whatever. You're still acknowledging two biological genders, which is something I want you to repeat. So that's why I repeat it. So without the foundation steps, the societal pressures, which we're going to get to, how those get to us, because this is how you can take control of your life on a level that's like, I don't know, it's almost like you were obese and no one ever told you that sugar is partially responsible for that. Eating lots of fatty things is partially responsible for that. Not exercising might be, might be a way that you would rather get rid of the weight. The movie Branded, of which I've probably mentioned three times in five years, is an epic example of how they make decisions to destroy the world. It's part of the plot of the film. And within 15, 20 minutes, you'll see the scenes I'm talking about, I'm pretty sure. But it was filmed in Russia. It was very interesting. It's got a, some famous American actors. The lead guy does a great job. It's a great film. It's indie, but it's really well made. But it's all about a guy who was in charge of PR, marketing. And in combination, in a back room, there was, uh, there was a reveal of the guy that played the priest from Exorcist 1, the guy that was dressed to look old, who in this movie actually is old. Like he was in the movie Dreamscape as well. He's been in a bunch of stuff. But anyway, he goes to a boardroom and tells all of these CEOs of various fast food companies that we're now going to sell fat. Anyone who got a problem with that? And they just all sat there like drones and shook their head. And then all of a sudden, there were commercials on TV where incredibly obese people were the center stage individuals. Okay. That is an exaggerated version of exactly what happens to us. Because all of our press, all of our media in general, uh, from magazines to websites, okay, everything that's printed, the books in all your famous bookstores, if it's not in the New Age section or someone published it themselves, it's being controlled by a conglomerate of editors who have marching orders. And marching orders can come two different ways. Marching orders can be very specific where you involve the editor in the conspiracy to, to essentially perform autonomously. You know, you say, this is what we're trying to do. Make sure everything goes that direction. The yes, sir. Poof, they do that. But then there's an indirect method, which is also very popular, which is you keep the people who are making the giant decisions of the world off-site. And because everything's electronic now, here comes a book manuscript. It's a touchy subject. Well, make sure you send it to headquarters in Europe. Some dude in the United States is like, okay, sends it off. And they just make edits to the book. And they give you any excuse necessary as an editor in America, as a sub-editor. That person just wants to get the book on the shelf to make more money and get to the next book. They're not going to sit there and question the ethics of the changes. And so things get modified. What are the other methods they get to us to program us? Television and film. Television, which is now largely through the internet, so just always count that into everything I'm saying. But they'll start creating emotional connections to these narratives. Remember the show Breaking Bad. For those of you who didn't see it, it's very simple. The bad guy was the good guy. The good guy was the bad guy. They reverse the polarity of what you should be thinking and 
when the good guy would suddenly start catching the bad guy, which was the brother-in-law, who was a sheriff or a cop or something, and you wish that guy to fail so that the bad guy could keep going. Because all the humor and all the turns and all that Breaking Bad uh, theme, where if you haven't seen the show, it's like something will be going bad, and then they actually turn it one step more negative. It's a negation of the negation, as they say in writing school. So you're, when you see things like that, you're getting emotional payoffs, dopamine payoffs in your mind for sort of like pulling the old handle on the old one-armed bandit. Lots of dopamine traveling in your brain because what happens with that? You might win if the three registers or more come up with whatever you're looking for, cherries, whatever. Well, they can set you up with enough, you know, narration indicators that you know, oh my gosh, this is going to happen. It's like a Guy Ritchie movie, right? Guy Ritchie writes some of the greatest collisions of characters in movie history. He literally collides them together sometimes. But you're like, oh shit, man, he's gonna, he's gonna find that person, that body, and he did that thing wrong, and then poof, something extra bad happens. And you're getting a dopamine rush. Whatever's going on during a dopamine rush is what your body wants you to continue repeating. There's very instinctual things about how the human body is programmed. Let's just say your body is a, uh, just a machine that's entertaining your soul. And it's still instinctual. It still needs to learn because perhaps when we were first here, we didn't have, uh, you know, the internet and iPhones and that kind of thing. So we're roaming around planes. We're finding new animals, new creatures, new insects, new fruits and vegetables, whatever. And we try things, and if they work out, you eat something and it, feel, it makes you feel good. It makes you no longer feel hungry. It gave you some energy. Maybe it gave you a hallucination when you kind of needed one, whatever. Maybe you just felt victorious because you swung a bone and you knocked out a boar. And then you killed it and then you ate it and everyone else ate it. And my gosh, you're now responsible for feeding the whole village you're, you're cherished, all these great things. Everything positive that occurs in your life is a dopamine drop. And that is where your mind will start to say, okay, whatever you just did, keep doing it. Which is why when we do things that are called bad habits, that manufacture dopamine, which is anytime you are happy with the payoff, you are going to be encouraged by your subconscious to do it again if not your consciousness. Now, your consciousness is something you can obviously listen to in your mind. You know, I'm not, I shouldn't be doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's your consciousness. Your subconsciousness is, hey, you're just sitting on your sofa. You're like, God, I'm bored right now. What should I do? And your subconscious is like, remember that thing we did? Let's do that again. How do you think serial killers become serial killers? engaging in heinous events because for whatever reason, probably because they were abused when they were young, they were the victim. And when they kill someone else, now they're not the victim anymore. That is all they really care about. Now, if they're doing something else to get the rocks off, well, then you just keep compounding the payoff. And they'll go back for more. And they don't care about anybody else. It's not about anyone else. It's about them. Everything has a foundation. Which is why when you want to get control of your mind, you've got to go back and take inventory of what you think you've learned over time. I used to say, you know, 400 episodes ago, one of the things you have to do is take everything that you think you believe and just like a hoarder show, put it on the front lawn. You are going to make three piles. Things you believe, things you don't believe, and the stuff you're still deciding. And typically that center pile is the much bigger pile where you're evaluating what you believe. But now inside your house, which is a representation of your mind, you're going to build a pantry. 
Set of shelves on the left is what you believe. Set of shelves on the right is what you don't believe. And in the center is a, uh, a little chopping block area, a table, where all the things are that you're going to be evaluating one way or the other. One of the reasons why I, you know, routinely mention certain things that I know that uh, aggravate some people, and it's absolutely not to aggravate anyone, is to try and reduce the aggravation. For instance, some of you believe the world is flat. Some of you believe the world is round. We really, really, really need to make sure that as we engage what we believe, that we're not trying to take a crap on other people who believe the opposite thing. I don't know anyone who's believed flat earth their entire life. So, if that's true, I think that's true, then you were once a globe person as well. And you just simply saw some things that made you believe that there's no indication, there's no proof that it is a globe. Because NASA says that every picture of Earth from space has to be a composite image made from high altitude images. Hmm. I understand. But look at religions. No matter how you parse a religion within Christianity, I don't even know how many divisions of Christianity there are, thousands I assume, each one of those divisions has been taught that their tiny interpretation is the only way to get to God, and there's no other way. You walk across the street to another church, you are going to hell. Wow, that's some hubris, right? We take on these generalities that we believe that whatever makes us happy makes everyone else happy. I mean, how could it not make them happy? Well, very simple. Have you ever gone to dinner with someone who hates the food that you wanted to eat the most tonight? You wanted Italian, but someone else that you're with doesn't like Italian. Typically happens when you either have a large group of friends or your associates that you work with, or hopefully your friends as well, and someone's like, man, I just ate Italian like four days in a row. It's not that I don't love it, but if we could not eat that, or maybe we could go get pizza or it doesn't feel too Italian-y. Maybe you get a barbecue pizza or whatever and doesn't not going to taste like Naples, right? You accept that in, instantaneously. Well, of course there's people not like me. But in other genres of our mind, we typically think that everyone else should be like us, even if you're very intellectual. And you may not ever vocalize that. But now let's just say your IQ is about 130. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess that everyone watching this show is about 130 at a minimum. Minimum. It only goes up from there, especially if you can habitually watch this stuff. And it's your tolerating me is half the IQ boost. But let's just say we take that down 20, 30, 40 points or even lower. Now that perception of everybody wants what I want and everyone needs to behave the way I want to behave gets to ludicrous levels. Now imagine, let's just take an example here, a mathematical example of how crazy this new age transformation is going. How many people are in the world? How many people of perhaps the largest group would consider themselves one group of people? I guess it'd be China, about 1.5 billion. India would be 1.2, 1.3. Now, is there any major similarities between China and India? Not really. And we like that. We like to have Chinese culture. We like to have Indian culture. Even if China is communistic, they've got some wonderful gifts for the world, and so does India. Well, look at all the other countries. I mean, Europe's blowing smoke up their own hole, thinking that, you know, getting rid of all the borders and unifying the currency is going to make everyone want the same thing. It's not going to do that at all. But some kids in America, very low vibration people, very susceptible to suggestibility. They're lost. They don't know who they are. 
Their parents have been torn apart by the economy. Perhaps their parents and them have bad educations and no trade skills whatsoever. And so they're looking for something. They're looking for something to give them some grip in this world. Like, I want to be useful to this planet, they say to themselves. And here comes an Agenda 21 belief system. Hey, you want to feel special? Yeah. Okay. Did you know you're not a boy? What? Did you know you're not a girl? What? Yeah, you're neither one of those things. And you know what? The man's been keeping you down. Really? Uh, have you ever gone to Comic-Con? Yeah. Okay, what did you wear when you were there? Oh, I wore a furry suit. Oh, well, that's what you are. You're a furry. Yeah, I am. And the funny thing is, is the goal is to lock you in puberty. Lock you way back in your teens so that you never mature up like an adult. It's the Peter Pan principle, right? Keep you down, keep you down inside your mind, but you can never achieve any of your goals because maturity is what's required. So they get these kids strung out on these utterly fantastical, bizarre, almost like a science fiction movie, plus a comedy, plus, I don't know, Brave New World, all mixed together. Some insane objective to entrance the world, to change the world. And these kids, always privileged white kids, always. If anyone else can get in that group, they're just emulating privileged white kids. And those are your Antifa kids, your BLM kids that don't understand life whatsoever. Don't have any history. Low education. They just are. They've mutilated themselves. And now they've made a mistake and they look in the mirror and they're like, oh man, I screwed up. But some guy's like, no, you didn't. You're doing great. Oh, really? Yeah. You know that little tiny dime-sized uh, area of your cheek you didn't tattoo? You should go get a tattoo there today. Get a pentagram. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. I mean, you're already unemployable. What's well, a little more ink, you know? But what they actually believe mathematically in their mind is they're going to convince every, every Chinese person, every Indian person, every Russian citizen, every Middle Eastern person, to come on board, man, because this is so good. They actually want that holy war to exist. It was a setup, and it was a spike and a slam. They were lost, and so they're looking for anything to make wrongs right. And this is their own opinion of wrong, not my opinion of wrong. I mean, hey, man, if you decorate yourself and you put all kinds of crap in your head to make yourself look like an animal and you're good with it, I don't care. You'd be my buddy. I don't care. Just don't try to change me. If I ask you to try to babysit a bad habit that you see me doing, then by all means, step in every single time I do that bad thing or start ebbing towards it. But we're not giving people permission to change the world. Have we done this before, where ascetic belief systems infiltrate the children of the world, the privileged children of the world? Because there's really a couple different types of privilege, but one of the definitions, which it's never defined by the press, is you have way too much money, you don't need to work, either your parents are paying your bills, or for whatever reason, you're renting that $200 a month room, and you make about $1,000 a month from whatever, unemployment or universal income or the coffee shop, if you can open it. And so you got, you got money, you got ancillary money, all your bills are paid and, you know, you're just wandering around, wanting to know, gee, I'd really like to get expensive things, but I guess I have to wait for some rationale, some architectural rationale to, to loot and pillage my town. So... I'm going to go back to an era where I wasn't, I was only partially alive during this era, but it, it's something that I've interviewed my buddies about who were in the pocket, man. And that would be the hippie movement of the 60s. Now, I don't have any knowledge about hippie movement outside the United States of America. One of my guys is from the East Coast. One of my guys is from the West Coast. 
One of my guys was not born inside of any religion. And one of my guys was born a Mormon into the Mormon religion, and then he pulled out of that whole thing, and now he's pretty agnostic. Okay. I asked them about the hippie movement because it was a wild about face within the, the last hundred years, maybe I should say 150 years, of American history. Because even though, you know, hard times, conquering this continent was rough, right? And a lot of horrible things occurred in doing so. After things had generally stabilized, men were hard because that's just what the journey had in store for them to conquer this place. And even if you were a son or a grandson of the last generation to really fight it out, you still had new wars that were coming online and you had very stoic parents because no one had any time for emotions. If you wanted to get emotional, you'd be very upset. But what was the movement? Both my buddies came from families with money. I think one came from a family with lots of money and one came up with pretty good money. They were trying to convince these kids to just deny everything that was commercial, to deny all of the sort of nuclear family concepts that we had put together, even though most of them ended up in a nuclear family that they created by themselves. But both gentlemen pulled out of the hippie era in haste. And it's not like they had anything tremendously bad to say about it, but they knew right away that what they did was they pulled out a weird subset of behavior from the good set of behavior and immediately saw that humanity doesn't really work well. And what's strange is at least one of them would probably push the red button to convert the world to socialism today. But I asked him about communes because they kept mentioning it. I lived in a commune once. And I really only asked the question, not out of any goal to pull something out of them that I, you know, I wasn't trying to fish for something or mine something out of them. But what they both said was the same thing in two different conversations, probably a couple of years apart from each other, to be honest. And neither one of them, even though they know each other, uh, engaged in this activity together. I'm giving this example because they were poisoned with a belief system. They were given a foundational platform of socialism, even though it probably wasn't called that back in those days, just called the hippie movement. And then they practiced it and it failed. Now I think they believe that with perhaps the internets, it'll be better this time. Hilarious. If anything, the internets should be teaching them that Brazil and Venezuela are knee-deep in socialism, and it is a horrid, horrid existence down there. In Venezuela, you can pay for a full tank of gas by giving the guy a cookie. There's, I watched a documentary where the guy did it, and the, the American that was there was like, or the, I guess it was the New Zealand guy, he was like, did we just pay with that with the cookie? He's like, yeah. He says, all the gas is free, and so these guys can't make any money, so the only thing that they do is they take anything you bring them. It's fantastic. But there's gas shortages in a country that has plenty of all the very tough oil to refine oil. But both of my buddies said this. They said they built a commune. I don't know where. I, I need to figure out the locations. And they all agreed to do a co-op, you know, to work together. Someone, they're all going to work together to clean clothes, to cook food, to build fires, do whatever they need to do, continue building the commune itself. And within a couple of weeks, only 3% of everyone involved continued working, and the other 97% just sat around lazy. These kids had never worked in their life, so it wasn't like they were coming off an assembly line going, man, I just need to relax, relax just give me a couple of weeks to kind of acclimate and all this other stuff. Nope. So one of my buddies said, okay, this is not, this is not the way it's supposed to be. He was one of the 3%. Goes off and creates another commune with the 3%. And then anyone else who wanted to join them, they told them about the previous experience. They said, look, if you turn into one of those 97%ers, then you're out of here. 
oh yeah, I would never do that. I'm I'm a workaholic, blah, 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 blah. And then it happened again. And that's when my buddy left it. My other friend told me a similar story. He also told me a story. The second guy told me a story that he thought that the communes were crap because what would happen is the most pretty people would run the place almost overnight. The good looking guy who could play the guitar. I guess that was a big thing back then. And then the girls would just fawn over him. And of course, best looking guy gets all the best looking girls, thus alienating everybody else. I thought it was interesting that that had probably been 50 years, well, not probably 50, 40 years since he actually had physically experienced this, and it still bothered him to this day. Now, back in the 60s, we may not have understood where that idea came from. Now, we know that foreign governments can do things to you, and I mean you, not just America, America could do it to you, you could do it to America, we could do it to other people. And you infect this group that can sit around and listen to you talk. Because why? Because they're privileged not to have to work. Or they're so incapable of working because perhaps they don't have any employable skills. I mean, you can have a skill on Monday, and as soon as it becomes pretty obsolete for whatever reason, I mean, you got to nut up and go find something else you do. There's always something out there that you like to do, someone will pay you for. So the generic thing about belief systems is they're typically created by the elders of a community to accomplish a goal. They're not just invented out of thin air. They always have a goal. Christianity's main goal was to get rid of, well, it was, you know, the reason why there's one God, an atomistic belief system, as opposed to the pluralistic system that was there before we had idols was that you couldn't get everyone on the same page if you worshipped uh, idols. Well, my God says I don't have to do that. Well, my guy says I can do this. So they wanted to muscle it all into an atomistic way of belief so that they could then hurt us and control us. I once had it told to me, and I think it's a, it might be more of a symbolic truth, but it makes sense that religion allowed families to exist. Religion allowed societies to finally put some stakes in the ground, stay in a location, work together, have some morals, and no one has to worry about somebody doing something bad to someone else. You don't murder, you don't steal, you don't cheat on your wife, you don't lust after your buddy's wife, Jesse's girl, you know. And that makes sense to me. I don't know how it actually technically took place and who went first and second and that kind of thing. As a village would interact with another village, sometimes it would be a positive experience, sometimes it would be a bad experience. What is unfortunate is that I think instinctually over time, when you had a group of people that looked very different than another group of people, probably more aligned with, uh, it could be physical stature. You, know, you could have some six foot eight people, where they're all six foot plus or more interacting with some pygmies that are, you know, three and a half feet to five feet. And then there's just, oh, look, I can, I can break this one, you know. But I think, unfortunately, pigment in our skin is probably one of the things that made us feel extremely different from each other. But as the do, different groups collided, I'm sure there were people that reacted badly and tribal wars started occurring. And so you built up this unfortunate prejudice against anything that's different than you because it never works out on average. Now, what I just talked about could be, and I think very much is, a subliminal instinct within the programming of the human genome. Now, let's just say there's 50 more of those. 50 more instinctual touch points in the human mind that, if activated, will categorically divide man. And so, if you are orchestrating Agenda 21, you're trying to divide and conquer the planet, meaning if America was following the Constitution, if we didn't have these scumbag Democrat governors shutting down their, you know, 
states and making everyone go bankrupt while they go out of vineyards and they get their hair did and they do other things. If we were under one party, just use the Constitution, man. It's simple. No one's going to touch anybody if that thing is enforced. Okay. Then we become damn near invincible as a country. You would have to get your nukes over here to destroy us without us stopping those from getting here. Well, that's exactly what folks that are wanting to control the world understand better than we do. So it's sort of like, uh, you know, you're in the 80s and you can go to a party, no problem. There's a party down the block. You can you hear it? Yeah, let's go join it. Okay. And you go in the 80s, and as, you know, as long as you don't have a bad reputation in your neighborhood, they're like, oh, my God, you live down the street, right? Yeah, hey, man, you mind if we join you? No problem. Okay. So that goes for a long time, and it's great. You invite your neighbors over. It's wonderful. And then all of a sudden you get, I don't know, some skinheads, some prejudiced group, and they're like, let's go to that party. Oh, oh, here's how we're going to play it. You act really nice for the first uh, 10 minutes, and you keep looking at me. Wherever we are, you keep looking at me. We'll spread out, and then we're just going to start brawl, and we're going to start busting stuff and breaking things. And how is that even possible? Because we're just letting anybody in because we trust each other. We get a few of those going on in a neighborhood, and you know what's going to start happening. Parties are going to be... Surrounded by bouncers. No one's going to be allowed in. Invitations are going to go out now because you don't want any of those people there. And now the organic flow from neighbors is not allowed anymore. Hey, you know, we're down the street. We just heard you guys. Do you mind if we come in? They're like, no. Well, why? I mean, you know, well, it's because we let some people in once and this crazy stuff happened. One guy died. But we're not that kind of, oh, yeah, we can't, we don't have time to figure that out right now. Come back tomorrow during the day, we'll have a conversation, and maybe after that you can go to the party. That's a tiny example of what's been going on on a global level between countries. Our youth is being programmed to destroy their country, to destroy their own lives. They don't understand the implications of many of the doctrines that they're being told. I'll give you a for instance. What if somehow we got to the point where universal income is the way that everyone makes their money and very few people work and do anything? Okay, how does food get prepared now? Oh yeah, a bunch of people raise food, either plant or animal. It gets all diced and sliced up and then it's trucked to your grocery store, and then you got to get someone to stock it for you, keep it, pay all the bills, build a building, da, 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 et cetera, et cetera. All right. Those people don't need to work anymore. Society starts to collapse. People start to die. Hmm. Well, why aren't we learning this lesson right now? Because that's where we're headed. That's what they're trying to do. It's because only a few people are doing it. But now, how is a country organized? You got the people on the bottom, politicians on the top. Depending on your country, maybe you're still playing make-believe and you got a king and queen up there. Regardless, same thing. They just want to create a narrative that is believable that this teeny tiny group of mentally ill people or very young, immature people with no history, no wisdom of any kind, their parents are carbon copies of them, just aged more, then the media puts a magnifying glass on them. If 10 of them show up, the media films it to make it look like a million people showed up. So when they throw a vote with Dominion voting machines, you might actually believe that that's real. And then they change your government they change that constitution. They change those protective clauses that keep you in a safe place. They drum up and increase the most microscopic laws that are impossible to enforce because it's an, they make the law so complex you can't know the law. 
Now, right now in Huntington Beach, California, because I'm in Orange County, California, they have, have there's been a rumor, okay, that there's a 10 o'clock, 10 p.m. curfew in all of California for this Thanksgiving dinner thing. Now, what has not occurred is any notification on our cell phones, any little pamphlet that's been held uh, handed to our homes. And so if you don't watch TV like me, you may never know that this exists. I have friends that are business owners calling around trying to figure out if it's real. But you can't be ignorant of the law if the law is never communicated to you. And by the way, these aren't laws. These may just be like, I don't know, some ordinance or something. But regardless, if you impose a restriction on human beings, you got to tell them first. You can't just pull someone over and go, all right, there's a curfew. And you're like, well, how on earth would I supposed to know that? You didn't, you could we do Amber Alerts in California based off a girl named Amber that was abducted and killed. So anytime a child is abducted and somebody knows and they rifle it into the police and it's meant to happen like in seconds after it occurs, we will get Amber Alerts all the time on our phone with the make and model of the car, some information about the suspect, and everyone's looking around for them. Hmm. I believe I have the numbers right, but Great Britain is now enforcing, and I think Canada as well. Of course, Canada is just a condom on the phallus of England, probably Australia as well. God bless you guys who are fighting the fight down there. But they have over 50 mentally ill identifications that are being enforced on other citizens. So some poor 80-year-old woman who may or may not own a TV, she might just be building puzzles, sipping tea and coffee. She's never been notified about any of these things, and she's old. She can't remember anything. But there's 50, over 50, of these mentally ill genders that you're supposed to remember such that if somebody is in front of you wearing something that's supposed to put them in one of those categories and you refer to them as a Mr. or Mrs. or a Miss, you get a ticket. Okay, well, let's take the Queen of England and Angela Merkel. Let's wire a shotgun to both their heads and say, okay, Merkel, you're enforcing 72 identifications in the EU. Otherwise, you get a ticket. I mean, they don't usually give it, as I understand it, but that's the law. England, you're over 50. So both you ladies, we're going to give you a chance. You can, you can take all day if you want, but you have to name the 50 plus in England, and you have to name the 72 in Europe, because ignorance of the law is no excuse, and you're, you're enforcing this on your people, detaining them, destroying their lives, giving them, you know, robbing them of their money. Go. And if you don't get it, we're pulling the trigger. Nobody would live. Nobody in the whole world could pass that test. Probably not even the author of the bill could remember them all. Maybe you get 25 right, but you still got another 25 in England and another 50 to go, roughly, in Europe. How is this even possible that a ludicrous thing like that is being enforced? You're worried about how to address a person. But down on the street, the Sharia law court just murdered some woman because they wanted to. Uh, a little girl just got castrated by her father. A 78-year-old guy is marrying a 7-year-old. Plans on having another big family, which means he's going to be raping that little girl for years. You have to believe in the rationale of the belief system in order to take it into your heart and soul. You do. So now, what do you believe? I mean, what do you really believe? Is, um, let me ask you a question, okay? There's this big thing about hurting people's feelings, right? That's one of the exacerbated fake emotions that has been injected into the human lexicon. Being offended. I have a whole episode on it, and what I say is that that belief system, does, uh, that belief doesn't exist, that emotion doesn't exist. All that's existing is you're angry. 
That's the only thing that really exists. So we're worried about hurting other people's feelings. We are being told to do the wrong thing, in some cases, in order to insulate someone else's feelings. Well, if you believe in a creator of any kind, and, you know, the, the guy that I always say to you folks uh, as the God that I believe in, I actually think that almost every single biblical punishment that's been documented by man will not be anything that that being will have had anything to do with ever. I think we create our own hells. But let's say you meet God and you have a record of doing the wrong thing for humanity, the wrong thing for your own personal life. Perhaps you've corrupted your kids, your friends, your families, your spouses, whatever, in order to make sure they don't get offended based on these human constructs of what is offended in the first place. Does God care that you offended someone? As long as you followed what you believe to be your God's suggested behavior which I think is doing no harm to others. Now again, harm, doing no harm, was pretty easy to define back in the day, but they've made it so cerebral and advanced it up so much that now it's anything, and they love it like that. Political correctness is a moving target on purpose so that you can never, ever win. It always hurts no matter what. You're always in trouble no matter what. Now they have tried to get man scared of man, and they phoned it in, and these mouth breathers are propagating this, carrying this. They can't feed their families, they can't pay their mortgages, their cars are about to get repoed, and they're worried about the common cold. But let me ask you this other God question before we move on. Let's say you're in a car with your buddy, and... Something happens. Both of you die in a car accident. Doesn't matter whose fault it is. Both of you are dead. And they're going to go meet God. Now, if you're existential, maybe you're God, and you'd still be able to get this wisdom from this example. Do you think, maybe, maybe this happens, but do you think you're going to evaluate your performance as man in this temporary vessel you had control over for a little while, with your buddy next to you? Are you going to go up there with all the people that ever interacted with you to tell tattletale on you? You think it's going to be that juvenile? Is it going to be grade school again? It's going to be the daycare center again? Well, he told me a poo-poo head, you know? I'm thinking not. I'm thinking you're going to get a nice personal interaction with God to assess anything that you feel like you want to assess. Perhaps assessment isn't even part of dying. You're just like, well, welcome. It's like a prodigal son situation. The guy that took all the inheritance and got some TNA and blew all the money, came back to his father, and the father was so happy to see him, he slaughtered the biggest bull. And it was the, it was the other son that was actually good, but lost a little bit. They said, hey, 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 why are you slaughtering a bull for that guy? He was the jerk that took half of our money. And he said, look, dude, you got your half. You do what you want with it. He's not getting another half. But my son is back. The one I love. He's my offspring. He's your brother. Stop being a douche. I think that's a story more about God than about man. But if we could learn something from that story, hey, I think our life would be a little bit better. One of the ways to look at this is that there are extremely specific archetypes that are underneath the belief system that are aimed at specific groups. But there are archetypes that are aimed at everybody. Because let me tell you, here's one of the funny things. And people have picked up on this over the last four years. If everyone capitulated to all of this gender neutral stuff, Overnight, we all said, fine, that's great. 72 in Europe, 52 in England, or whatever it is. Absolutely. And everyone memorized them, and no one ever got that wrong. Oh, well, then the tension's gone. There's no more fighting between us. Now we're starting to unite again. Guess what? 
They'd come up with something else. They would come up with something else. For those that are so concerned about racism, all right, let's take that just a couple steps further. Um, pick a race, any race. We'll pick a black race. Everyone else on earth is eliminated off the planet. Everyone else who's here has some black blood in them because that's, uh, according to Chuck D., uh, that's what makes you black. Any ounce of black in you, you're black. I think he's right. That's how we classify it. Okay, so everyone else who's pure out of that pigmentation, they're gone. Now what happens? Well, Malcolm X talked about when he was a kid, he was a light-skinned brother. He got crap for being light-skinned. Oh, so now we're going to have the shades of black that are going to have to fight out. You're now going to be a shadist. You're too dark. You're too light. You have something other than black blood in you. Can't prove it, but I can tell. You're Lenny Kravitz. Okay, so all mulatto people are then the second that are eliminated. Now the rest of the blacks look at each other and go, the Africans are really dark, and they're looking at us white, or the black guys over here in America, which they call white. Now you're not black enough, or you're not brown enough. Well, okay, I guess the lighter brown black people are going to have a lot more access to education and weaponry. So they're going to destroy all those super dark people. Probably come up with some, either reprise a bunch of the old slanderous names. And now we get down to a one shade race. And this could be any race. I'm just using blacks. Okay. Now what's going to happen? Well, some people have blue eyes who are black, and some people have brown eyes who are black. Hmm. So even though you're lighter, you've got the white man's blue eyes in you. You got to go. So all blue eyed guys are gone. You see where we're going, right? But eventually it would turn into who's too tall, who's too short. Who doesn't have enough hair, who has too much hair. Th they will continue to go to the next level which is why none of this works, why the party of tolerance is the most untolerating people. They're always the inverse of what they think they are because they are low vibration, low educated people. Antifa is a fascist organization. They will march down the street talking about no justice, no peace, and then they attack a black person. Because they have BLM people with them too. I mean, it's just nuts. We are seeing their brains, their dysfunctional brains in cities destroying their own property, their own communities. And everyone seems to forget the 1% movement that happened about 10 years ago in Wall Street. Remember when they all went down there and made tents and they were so profound, their lattes and their cell phones? What was that movement about? It was about them believing that 1% of the world owns the whole place and 99% are stuck at the bottom and can't do anything to fix the problem except for convert to socialism. Hmm. But they all shop at Amazon, Walmart, <laughs> all the big brands, got to have their Nikes, got to have all their corporate stuff. So they're shopping out of the 1%, blaming the 1% for having the money that they made. When they could go to the bomb and pop shop, oh, but they burned that down. That's right. What is this whole thing in 2020 doing? It's making banks and corporations massively rich. Massively rich. If you thought Bezos was rich today, it for every month this goes by, that guy's adding zeros on his paycheck because everyone's ordering everything on Amazon. Why? Because you, you're terrified to go into a store. You're taught that if we wore masks, this thing would be over by now. Doesn't matter if you do. As a matter of fact, there's no logic in it at all. If you went to a store where everyone's wearing it, and you don't, though they're protected, you're not, hey, you're the one at risk. This common cold has a 14-day gestation period because that's what colds have, right? We've all had colds before. 
You know, it creeps up on you slowly over time. If you don't get enough sunlight, take your vitamins, eat right. But they're worried that you're going to pin it down to a particular retailer. It's impossible to pin it down to a retailer. You can't. If you get mail delivered to your house and you believe the stupid, what was it, MIT, Harvard Medical Experiments, where they say they got COVID to live on a surface for like some ungodly amount of hours, or you get your mail within 24 hours, well, that's well within the proverbial envelope of time that they said COVID could exist on a surface, which is all a lie. Those conditions don't exist in the real world. The world is being torn apart by all this crazy brand new belief system. A system that wasn't broken in many cases is being broken. The stuff that was broken and perhaps is broken, it definitely isn't getting fixed because of these people. Because they, in, well, the controllers invent games that can never be won. We had a gigantic example of this after 9-11. We had a boogeyman created out of a conglomerate of agents for a particular alphabet agency who made a database of their agents. They created an an army called Al-Qaeda, who George Bush Jr. would often refer to as its clinical name, Al-Qaeda, because he was always having a conversation on Air Force One or in the backyard using the proper... um, intelligence description of them. And so you come out and say it. Just like Joe Biden was talking about this comprehensive voter fraud system in the room before he walked out and repeated it. I got a buddy of mine who does that all the time. He's in his 70s, and if we would do a presentation together, I would say, look, you're not supposed to say that. We're not allowed to admit that. And he go, oh, oh, okay. Now, he'd already been told 20 times, but he's old, so he's forgetting And what did he do? Walk right out in the presentation. Third thing out of his mouth is the secret thing he's not supposed to say. We never got in trouble, but that's just because the people who told us not to tell anybody probably never found out that we admitted it. But they created Al-Qaeda. It was the random group of guys that hates us. And so we're starting to fight this war that can't be fought because you can't find the enemy. When we had Al-Qaeda fatigue... John McCain flies over to the Midwest, or sorry, Middle East, excuse me, Midwest of the Middle East, over to Syria and elects a brand new group of people, one of them Trump killed, and created ISIS. Brand new name, totally funded. They were stealing supposedly billions of dollars worth of oil out of northern Syria and then finding probably Turkey to sell it to or whatever. Probably all lies. Brand new enemy. Religion, depending on where you live, is either beneficial to you or not beneficial to you. If you're involved in any type of religion where you commonly think about exterminating another religion, probably not doing much for you. If you can be involved in religion and compartmentalize it to your life, you're probably okay. It's just for you. Maybe your wife or husband believes the same thing. Maybe your kids grow up to believe the same thing but maybe they don't, but it's between you and God at a minimum. Again, they're not going with you to go into the room to be evaluated if you believe in such things. God would need no testimony from another person for he would know it all. So if someone's going to speak on your behalf, it's a pointless exercise. God already knows your half. He knows both halves. He doesn't need to get both sides of the story. He is both sides of the story. It's funny because, you know, I've talked to a psychologist one time at a church of mine because he was a psych professor at Pepperdine. And he just offered me a session. I thought, man, I would, because I was reading tons of psychology books. And, you know, I used to play darts together at his house and just had a really good friendship with him. And he really helped me resolve some anger issues with my parents, which was very minor, but it was still a pimple that needed to be popped, you know. But I have plenty of friends here in... California, both just friend friends that are just good old normal people going to psychiatrists, and I've got some celebrity friends that have done it. But what typically happens in these sessions 
is that a person doesn't understand why they behave a certain way, why they have certain thoughts that they have. It's going to be a slight digression on that meeting with God, but think about it. You go up there with maybe a bad record here and there, hopefully nothing horrid. But even if you had a serial killer past, you go up there and you're like, I I don't know why I needed to do this, but I felt like I did. And so I did this horrible thing to a bunch of people. He's the ultimate psychologist. Except where a psychologist will sit and listen to you and write it, write notes down and suggest things to you and use various techniques on you to get you to hear your own voice and charge you a lot of money per hour. God doesn't do that if God exists. He or she would know it all. Well, you know, it was really this, 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 all triggered together. That's how you became that killer. I knew you were going to be that way, and there was nothing that was going to stop that except for me intervening, which I don't do. So don't worry about it. We'll do better next time. But next time might be exactly the same way. You are your soul. You're not your mind. You're not your body. What I don't know is whether or not a serial killer actually um, is happy a lot of the time. I tend to think not, which is why they go out to try and get a new dump of dopamine and do something bad again. So hopefully if you came back, you would stick to your guns with being happy, happy, and not uh, run off doing something nuts. So how do we stop this problem. I think that we're all figuring it out. And the big part is to divorce yourself from social media. Again, if you're trying to find people like yourself, maybe that's how you quarantine it down, but you, you keep a little bit. Let's just say you wanted to know what other deep thought listeners are thinking. So you at least quarantine it to just one little place you go. You don't go to your feed. You don't Get rid of all your friends off social media. Just get rid of them, unless they're maybe a part of that clique where you find like-minded people. What's the other thing you can do? Turn off all mass media. Your TV can stay on. You can watch a bunch of puppy dog videos on YouTube. Watch your favorite movie on whatever movie service you're using. But I think that most of us in 2020 are viewing old shows completely different than we used to. We can see the indoctrination and how it was turned on and how it was ramped up. I mean, you know, I just mentioned during a previous episode, but watch Leave it to Beaver or My Three Sons or whatever show, Brady Bunch or whatever, and then just watch Cardi B. Watch a reality show. And just feel the difference in the emotion that they're expressing in the show, the goal of the moral base, what was Leave it to Beaver's whole thing? It was a standard archetype that went all the way up to the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? It was somebody did something wrong at the beginning. They hit it. Then there was the slow reveal. And then poof, at the very end, it was, I know I shouldn't have done that, but da, da, da. it was a moral uptick at the end of every episode to make you feel better. Brady Bunch, same way. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the same way. It really clicked with me when I watched, uh, it was a Fresh Prince episode where they broke a lamp at the very beginning of the episode and then tried to hide it. This has been done several times and cheers and a bunch of other stuff. And then, of course, at the end, they got in more trouble for hiding it than for breaking it. Moral uptick. Don't lie. Just if something bad happens, admit it. All right. What's today? What's breaking bad? Make meth. Never follow where it goes to hurt people who take it. Feel really excited about the meth maker and his buddy. The cop that's starting to get onto their uh, path, well, let's wish him all the harm because we don't want this negative Luciferian character to be stopped. If you're awake, then you get a privileged title. And I think you can call yourself one of a couple things, if not both, which is you're an elder of your village, which just might be your house. 
The other one is, has a little bit of an extra skill to it, which is what I call the chieftain. The chieftain, only you know if you're a chieftain, which is if you envisioned yourself on a remote island, you're part of the lost cast, right? And you're on a remote island and you got nothing. You got whatever was in the wreckage and then you look back at the island and you can see some things that look like they're edible. You can see some wildlife in there. Okay, you got to figure out how to kill those things. If you envision yourself as a person who would take charge and build the society, protect the women, protect the children, hunt, we're going to divide up uh, uh, tasks. And of course, there's some women out there that'll hunt like crazy. But whatever you identify as in terms of your capabilities, You split off into those groups and you are just one that's going to work with people. You know that people are different. You know you're going to deal with a lot of psychological conflicts, but you're ready for it. You're going to keep steady and calm and cool. But as an elder, you've got libraries of wisdom. You know the difference between shit and Shinola, like they said in The Jerk, right? Then you're a chieftain as well. But let me give you another upgrade that only you know. And that would be, you're also an architect of society. I don't think we get to that level without a lot of study. If you're watching this show regularly, you probably are an architect. You may have never been given the job yet, but you could come in and, well, the way, one good way to think about, or one easy way to think about and being an architect of humanity would be either look at the robber barons that wrote Magna Carta, about 1000 AD, or look at the forefathers of America who wrote the Constitution. You know, bizarrely, they're all Masons for some reason, but perhaps even the Masons weren't so corrupt back in those days, don't know. Seems strange, it does. But you could write a Constitution. You could write a Declaration of Independence by yourself. Because you understand. You could write the Bill of Rights because you understand the causality connections with a lack of freedom. You know how subtle freedoms can be eroded and you know how blatant freedoms can be eroded. You understand a judicial system of being accused of something. There's an evidentiary uh, phase of discovery. Then there's a trial. There's witnesses. You get equal representation on both sides, meaning someone goes up to the box to talk. For the prosecution, you get to be a defendant. You get to ask the same, whatever questions you want to that person. If you're at those levels, then I think that you are extremely equipped to evaluate everything that you serendipitously absorbed throughout your life. And then you can conduct a massive audit on your own system. There are certain things in life that feel like Well, they were described as being very liberating. You know, for my friends that, who figured out that they were gay and perhaps lived in areas of the world that weren't accustomed to that. Let's say 80s, 90s. But they moved to an area where it was much more accepted. Then they were liberated because they didn't feel like in their own mind that everybody was sending darts at them. They usually move to a big city where it doesn't matter what you are, no one pays attention to you. So sometimes that can just be the food that you're looking for. If you look a certain way, talk a certain way, whatever, nobody's like jumping from you. That could be liberating. If you're in a job that's not really taking advantage of your skills, you took it because you needed the cash, or maybe it's your first job and you haven't quite found that other job yet, you know in your heart of hearts, every day that you're alive, you're more than this. And so you go home and you keep churning on that other skill that's really your, your love of your life. And then you transition into it and you're liberated, man. What was it? Uh, the lead singer of Huey Lewis. Uh, there's so many actors and singers, I should just say it this way. But the Huey Lewis guy, forget it. is that his name? Yeah. He was like a landscape guy before he got his first album out the door. The um, 
the Baker, Tom Baker, who played Doctor Who in the 70s for a long time. He was a construction guy. He was like building a building. And then he said, I got to go and do this audition. And then poof, he becomes one of the most famous sci-fi celebrities in BBC history. Well, that could be you. Just think. If you were to reset your brain to a common law practice, what will end up happening is, in my opinion, is what will bubble to the top of your cauldron will be all of this crazy. And then you can just wipe it off the top into the trash can. And there you are. You have the most perfect stew, which is your brain, your belief system. You're not hurting anybody. Once you purify your mind, and I do this ritually, I mean, I do this system ritually. I study everything I believe as much as I possibly can day to day. But once you do it and you live in it, you live in the purity of your mind. As you run into other paradigms through other people, you have a perspective that's so much more clear. You know, one of the things I noticed, and it's just interesting when I used to be on Twitter before they suspended us for revealing event 201 to Jim Acosta's feed, which was the event I just pushed send and boom, I was immediately banned. I would look at people's replies to things that are very heated. Of course, that's all Twitter is, is a divide and conquer platform, which is why no one should be on it. I would see these diatribes, these like huge monologues from people that are just stating the most trite repetitive stuff. And what wasn't being said was anything really conclusive, anything truly inter introspective. And so what I would do is get up there and put in just a sentence, half a sentence. And I knew that that reply was, was uh, getting people to look inside themselves. So a lot of people will see it and they can't make any sense out of it because they're still stuck on stupid. They're still stuck on the divide and trying to spread it around as much as possible. There are a lot of people at the end of the day, whether or not they realize it or not in these other groups that are keeping a tally in their mind of how much they've destroyed society today. And they sleep better the more that they've done it. I was in a parking lot yesterday for lunch because I had to stand outside. And I parked my car and I go up to this window and where I'm, Standing, there's a bar, like a sports bar. It's now all outside. A tattoo parlor and my smoke shop. And this place I eat. And there's a bunch of dudes out, middle of the afternoon. And this guy is yelling and screaming from a car behind me. And I'm kind of like, you know, I'm walking in. You know, you don't hear things until you really focus because I'm just parking my car. And then over the next 10 minutes, this guy was yelling at somebody over by the tattoo parlor. I don't even know who he was yelling at because he said some guy in a yellow hat. And I looked over. I couldn't see anyone in a yellow hat. But all these, like, bikers, these big badass tattoo guys, the guys that own the shop, they're just sitting out there smiling, listening to this guy. And this dude is on a roll, standing next to his car, yelling at somebody calling them all these names. But I turn around to order my food, and there's a father's son right in front of me. And there's a little nine-year-old kid right in front of me. He's all bundled up, a little mask on his face. And he's just looking at this guy. And I just saw myself as a kid right there. He's seeing stuff that uh, is probably healthy for him to see. <laughs> but he kind of looked up at me for a split second, and I just looked at him, and I smiled. I don't have a mask on, so you can see my face. I said, whatever you do, I said, don't ever be like that guy. And he, I saw his eyes. He just went, yeah, it's kind of what I was just thinking, you know. So we, you know, his dad's right there in front of big old dude. No stranger danger there. And I just, uh, I'm watching the kid. I'm watching him suck all this down, you know. And finally, I just, you know, we're saying something else, you know, just like, oh, my gosh, this is nuts, isn't it? Yep, yep. I said, what, what you're really seeing right there is there's a problem inside him. All that stuff he's saying, a bunch of filthy, horrible stuff, man. 
Turns out the kid actually wasn't the son of the guy in front of me. His dad was one of the owners of the tattoo parlor shop, so I know the kid's seen quite a bit probably. But I just said, you know, you're really hearing about all of his broken stuff inside of him. And I liked it that I had the opportunity to say that because when I was a kid, adults saying stuff like to me, that to me changed my life. It changed my perception of everything. Uh, there was a relative in my family, and I think this was a false assessment, to be honest, before I say this. One of my relatives, um, my mom was talking about this relative, and she said, you know, I don't think he likes himself. That's why he behaves the way he behaves. Now, as I got to know him a lot better as I got older, I think that, again, was a false assessment, or maybe it was that phase of his life that I have no information on to this day. But that kind of thought process to go, wow, people actually don't like themselves? It was such a shocking twist in my brain. I didn't think that was possible. How can you not like yourself? And then I've met several people since then who do not like themselves. You know, I got a good friend of mine who will tell you to your face how much he hates himself. And I don't really understand that at all. Like, if you were really that bad, dude, I wouldn't be your friend. And you wouldn't have the hundred of friend, hundred friends that love you and rely on you daily that you never let down. So what, what's your big thing? I used to say, and I, I probably still do, but haven't had to say it in a while. But, you know, if you're raised to believe something, whether it be religion or something else, and you continue to just swallow what your parents shovel down your throat or society shovels down your throat, and you complete a couple decades with that belief system inside you, regardless if there's any truth to it at all, you are almost genetically prohibited from ever shaking that belief in its entirety. Because once you, start sh once you actually shake off a belief system, there's something that happens and that is, what if you were deceived as a kid into some type of religion that was bad? And then you wake up and find out, wow, that was a bad religion. If you can come to complete closure on that, something will happen. You won't badmouth that religion in a really super negative way. You hear me talk about George Carlin a lot. I think he was mentally broken by the Catholic Church. He had a very bad experience going to the Catholic schools in Brooklyn. So his routine on stage was, there's a, there's a little segment he does on it that is the most hateful black oil version of him, but it's only about that. Everything else he can make fun of in a positive way, but when he, goes on a, when he went on to religion, it was horrid. He's still hurting inside. He didn't resolve it which is why he projects what's inside himself. So we know about religion. We know that's an easy one. Everyone who isn't in religion in a very hell and, you know, was a hell and brimstone kind of way, fire and brimstone, excuse me. You can look at it much more objectively and just say, yeah, well, that, that group of people's really worried about all these things, all these punishments. They've got God down to an abject moron who's just sitting down there going, what else can I burn? Which is all wrathful, crazy, crazy human. You know, if, if, if there was a human on earth that had all the despicable behaviors of God that has been documented in the Bible, you wouldn't be his friend. You would be like, that dude's nuts, dude. And you just don't even get next to him because if you say the wrong thing, he'll try to set you on fire. But at the same book, they'll, they'll tell you the truth, that he's infinitely patient and forgiving and <laughs> you can't have both men. You can't have both. Infinite? Infinitely forgiving? Why does hell exist again? If there's infinite forgiveness? Oh, but you got to follow these rules that man will hand down to you. you know, it's like strange, right? We are a being that's trying to figure this thing out. We don't have it right. And I don't know if we'll ever get anything right. You have to, obviously, get rid of the individuals who are manifesting this divide globally. They love religion because they know it just takes a, just a little eyedropper in the ocean to get the ocean to fight itself. They know that. And so they do it. They're pouring buckets in. Where they know there's love, 
they can create divide. But they've now come after the subatomic behaviors of man. They're trying to get your autonomic system, the one that makes you breathe, the one that makes you walk, the one that keeps you alive when you're asleep. They want that thing to rebel against you. They want to divide every single thing that's joined except themselves. What's the motto of the show? The motto of the show is rebuilding humanity from the bottom up. That's why I do so many of these episodes. But there's two ways to look at that if you believe it. And you're a contributor. You're just as much a contributor as I am. In fact, I would always give probably more credit to people I don't even know who watch the show. Seeing what I mean and, and, and paraphrasing it in a much easier container. But we have the organic growth out of societal problems, which is the best way to do it. And then we have the more militant, violent, sudden transformations in human society, known as revolutions, known as civil wars, known as world wars. There's a, there's a divide in the belief system. Right now, the group that is causing the problem for the world, including their subjects, is a very, very tiny group of people. I don't care what you believe. I promise you the media has put a magnifying, magnifying glass on these problems, on these individual groups made of almost no one, to make you think that Antifa is a one billion strong army. The BLM is a one billion strong army. We can address any of their concerns intellectually, without their violence, without their killing, without their prejudice, their intolerance, and their fascism. But as long as they're on the streets fighting, we can't have a conversation, can we? And we know that 90% of these quote-unquote members are there to steal stuff out of stores under the umbrella that they're protesters. We know that for a fact. We want to deal with this as soon as possible with the least amount of conflict between us. What's the best way? Well, the best way would be to find out a way to calm these groups down, to, to get them to list their demands and see what we can do. Now, we'll probably throw out most of them because they're probably unfounded. But what if there's some good stuff in there? I guarantee you, you know, as I've said, unification of the police methodology within a particular country should be absolute. Someone in Alaska, like I said, should have the same treatment as someone in Florida. Substitute your country with the two farthest uh, regions from each other, and you understand what I'm saying. Because here's the thing. During revolutions, let's just say, the problem is, is that this, the members of the revolution who are usually doing most of the fighting are in a fight or flight state of mind until it's over. And we know, just go watch my left brain, right brain episode, that during those phases, we don't think very clearly, meaning we don't make good choices. The dictators that have risen up over time, hopefully that's the right word, arisen, arose, come into power. They have typically been made of the gullible masses because what could a dictator possibly convince but a gullible mass? They can't convince the intellectuals of a particular society to go along with them. So guess who has been traditionally the target of those groups? All the smart people. It's so bad that, you know, this, this firebombing of Dresden in Germany, I believe that's in Germany, you may have had Hitler call it in. Could you please bomb Dresden? That's where all my resistance is. Mao, he just killed him. Pol Pot, just killed him. Mussolini, just killed him. Anyone who will uprise against you will get killed. What is China doing? They're using the social credit system 
to essentially kill off a person's life. House arrest, if you write a single article about legitimate corruption within their country. I'm sure at their higher levels of the CCP, they view themselves as, hey, this is a team effort. We are engaging in criminal activities, but it's for the greater good. Just, you don't understand all the big picture stuff, so shut up. Hmm. Poisonous beliefs. There are so many flavors inside the vending machine of poisonous beliefs now that you will probably have to, depending on how strong-minded you are and how centered you are as of today, you're going to be living in a constant defense mode for a while. Hopefully not forever. Meaning every day you get up, as someone starts to tell you you've done wrong or did you hear they passed a new law? You know, the one in Scotland, I guess, got passed where the kids can now tell on their parents at the dinner table, you know, that parents say something offensive. And the Scottish court system is going to take a kid's word over his parents. Whoa. Whoa. Unbelievable, man. Unbel I can't wait to hear the first cases. It's going to be horrific. It used to be that your mind was your own domain. You could do whatever you wanted with it. And only, you know, maybe your spoken word. But I even think your spoken word was protected. I mean, our First Amendment's our First Amendment. And again, as we say on this show, one of the things, one of the reasons why I always tell you guys that if you're angry at someone, you probably should practice arguing with them by yourself. Because if you don't, you're going to say stupid things that you might regret the second your mouth produces the word. So get it all out of your system. But now we're getting to a point where surveillance has infected your children in Scotland. Your children are little security cameras now. And what do they know about all the, all the contextual circumstances of everything that you say? They're getting you to fear what's inside your head as being a crime that they're going to find a way to persecute you for, prosecute you for, charge you for it. Wow. Again, I think if I called every single one of you in January of this year and I said, what if the World Health Organization phoned in that the common cold was suddenly more deadly than everything else in the entire world and they told everyone to stay inside, not work, to fear each other, you couldn't be close to each other, you had to wear a mask on your face, which isn't scientifically capable of protecting you against what they're telling you is a danger. Do you think they could pull it off? And what's crazy is, and this is just a guess on my part, is I think most intellectual people would go, no way. I mean, yeah, some people would do it, but not the masses. The masses won't do that. I mean, everyone has to work. Everyone has to feed their kids. And boy, were we wrong. But what if I had called the same number of people as a control case outside of our group? I might have got a whole bunch of thumbs up. Well, there was no way for me to conduct that exercise because, one, I didn't know it was coming, and two, I don't probably know a lot of those other people. So we all got surprised, and it's still going strong. It's going crazy strong. The lockdowns in this latter part of 2020 are worse than the initial ones. Unreal. So if you see the wisdom in this episode, you're definitely going to want to paraphrase it better than I put it over an hour and whatever, 30 minutes or so. You people are the key to reboiling this, refining this, and getting it out to your next of kin that will listen to you, the folks that are like you, so we can continue churning the message down to a single sentence, a single word, something, and maybe start affecting change to a more stable method of existing. Thought police used to be a pretty indirect crime in this world. It no longer is. It's a blatant ritual. And I don't think that anyone can survive that system ever. Ever, ever, ever. And I'm just going to repeat this again. I would love to have, here's a little homework for you. In the comments down below, 
Tell me if you've ever seen THX 1138. And as a little bonus, tell me if you've ever seen Rollerball 1975. If you can't write yes, you need to get to at least the first movie. Study it based on where we are today and the vectors of where we are going from today. In THX 1138, you're looking at a fascist world. The cops are God. But there's going to be a point in the movie where the main character is going to talk to Jesus in that movie. And it's not going to be what you think. So think about Boston Dynamics creating all these robots. All these robots around the world and uh, what is it, Saudi Arabia now, they're cops. Or they're, they're little cops, you know. It's going there. But watch the movie. Let me know what you think. If you've already seen it, let me know what you think. And I will say this, if you haven't seen it in 20 years, which is a high likelihood, go rewatch it with your new mind. And then ask yourself, even though it's a fictional film, one, we know predictive programming is one of their most coveted techniques of talking to each other. They love to throw it in our face. It also helps us to absorb the absurd because we've already seen it once before. It's not such a shock to the system when we find ourselves in that system. But rewatch it again. And let me know what you think. And if you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. Please bookmark it just in case crazy continues. We're doing well so far. I think at this point, the shadow banning on the channel has reached a point where they've pretty much capped us under 5,000, and they just won't let it get over 5,000. So do me a favor. If you dig the show, promote it somewhere where you think it might get absorbed well. My recommendation is to find an episode that contextually addresses what one of your friends is talking about and say, you know, you were just talking about this. This dude did this episode. He's a weird guy. He's in black and white. That helps him find it, by the way. And say, watch this and let me know. Let's have a discussion. But on there we have video, audio, social media, an all-new remastered season one, a store, and a, two places where you can donate to the show. We've had some pretty generous uh, PayPal uh, transfers recently, so thank you so much. Uh, in the credits, by the way, if you go over $25 on any method of donation in one, one go, then you, your color of your name is um, it's going to be sorted to the tippy top of the credits, and you're going to be orange-ish kind of whatever color. It's not orange. I'm not going to go Masonic on you. But anyway, until the next episode, take care of yourself and someone else. And I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now. out.